Hello, and welcome to the Humumu Halloween Home Horror Hoedown. The podcast where we watch 31 horror movies throughout the hallowed month of October. Ranging from the critically acclaimed to film school projects gone gruesomely awry. And we take them all way too seriously. I'm your host, Mike Hummel. And I'm your host, Sully Hummel. Now warning, we use a ghoulish number of spoilers, so watch the movies first. Second warning, we don't know anything about anything, so don't take us seriously while we take these movies seriously. There's something vaguely poetic that we are going to be talking about two movies called The Unborn on the same day that I went into town to participate in a reproductive rights march. I know. I I put a note for that because I was like, ooh, yeah. Ooh. Yeah, it just, it seems to fit well. These were both movies where pregnancies played some important role in the story. Oh, yeah. In the, in the Evil Twin, <laughs> for sure. But, but the one we watched for today. The Unborn from 2009. From 2009. It doesn't really have pregnancy as a big part of in and of itself which was a surprise right but it is very much about like what is passed on from generation to generation like a genetic thing yes uh, well and jumby wants to be born right right and of course by the end she is pregnant which duh like she vomits at some point during the movie her boyfriend calls her hormonal mm -hmm. and what was the other thing um and of course, the why is this all happening now? Like, yeah. well, obviously. Yeah, but I, I didn't expect it. I was like, oh, yeah, of course. I mean, for the entire movie, I was expecting her to be pregnant. And then I kept thinking how weird that is because the demon in question, I mean, it, it wasn't, but in theory, it was her twin brother. So she was going to be pregnant with her twin brother. Which I was like, that's not right. That's This isn't good. But then it never happened. So, okay. Yeah. I mean, her twin brother, who she killed, I mean, inadvertently, strangled <laughs> with her umbilical cord yes. there, in, in the womb. There was a good question in the movie of, he died in the womb. How? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's just so many, you so know, many such statistics in all the different ways. A piano fell on him. <laughs> yes. He was drunk driving. Yeah. It's a pretty shocking thing to learn. This poor girl had so many revelations about her life during this movie. Like, she finds out for the first time, she's, what, 20 years old? She's early yeah. 20s. For the first time in her life, she finds out that she had a twin in utero. Mm -hmm. And she also meets a grandmother she never knew she had. Yeah. Like, that's a lot of unexpected family popping And then up. at the end of the movie, she finds out she's pregnant with twins. Right. Oh, there was a lot going on. So twins were a big part of the story. At one point, the old Jewish grandma asked, what are twins but mirrors, a kind of mirror? And I'm like, well... I feel like if you asked anyone who was a twin, they might, I don't know, feel like there was perhaps more to them than that. I mean, it doesn't really work because one of them has to be something for the other one to be a mirror of. Like, right. they're not just both mirrors. I mean, to say what is a twin but a kind of mirror is just to, like, reduce them down to nothing but their looks, maybe? And even that, it's only if it's somebody who is an identical twin. True. Although, perhaps not, because a mirror wouldn't be an identical twin. No, it would be a flipped twin. Ooh. We don't have flipped twins. Flipped twins. I wonder if there are flipped twins. Like, if something happened, I don't know how that could happen. I mean, I feel like that would be a type of, what is it, fraternal twin? Yeah. The ones that aren't identical? But I mean, could you really call them not identical? I mean, they're not, but it's so tricky and subtle, the difference. I don't know. Hmm. So I wasn't expecting Nazis to show up in this movie. No, you're always surprised when the Nazis show up. Yeah. And here's the thing with the Nazis, though, that I was realizing is, so they put in the whole Nazi thing, Nazis experimenting with twins and trying to make their eyes turn blue. And it was kind of a cultish and whatever. And sometimes it made kids die and it made her grandma's twin brother die. And oh. then come back to life. Yeah. And then he came back to life. But the thing is, 
all that Nazi stuff was completely irrelevant. He could have fallen off a swing and hit his head and died and come back two days later. So it wasn't the experimenting that the Nazis were doing that made him uh, like an open door, I guess. Yeah, I guess. I mean, that since they were doing occult things, I'm sure that that was the implication, but... Yeah. It didn't feel like there was, other than the fact that they, she said their experiments involved the occult. I don't know. I'll, I'll allow it. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was kind of unclear. And then they, that was just kind of it. Like they started it and then, and then that was it. Then it all, the book definitely was able to continue doing what they were doing without any additional help from Nazis going forward. It wasn't like nice. modern Nazis were involved or anything. No, that's good. <laughs> Well, so basically, Casey... Casey is being haunted by a Dibbuk, which is a spirit that's wandering the world that wants to possess her, I guess. Well, okay, so a Dibbuk is, according to this movie, the soul of a dead person who was barred from heaven. But then I sort of stopped paying super close attention for a while, so I don't know if it explained what the Dibbuk's actual goal was. Like, is it just there? Is it... Is it on Earth to just wreak havoc because it can? Or is it like trying to get into heaven somehow? No, it does. It's not trying to get into heaven because there was some point where they mentioned like it's a, it was once human and, you know, now it's whatever. It's an animal. So it's, it's just trying to get into people to be in the world, I think, and just get to live. Mm hmm. But in order to do that, it's happy to do terrible things along the way. Yeah. So so she's being haunted by this Dibbuk, and she's trying to get herself exercised. <laughs> Indeed. I spend a lot of time, time trying to get myself exercised, and yeah. it never works. I mean, I think you have to have faith and believe that it will work. <laughs> That brings me to one of the interesting points that I noticed in this movie is there was a whole lot of consent gathering at the beginning of the exorcism. Yeah. And I think like part of it was like, please say into the camera that you are here <laughs> of your own free will. Like yeah. if something goes bad, you know, we have evidence, which I don't know that that would be enough anyway, but still. But it was a refreshing difference from the many, 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 many exorcism movies we've seen where the young girl being exorcised has no free will and mm -hmm. is just having things done to her. Yeah, although it was also a very quick, not not overall, but the quick exorcism before it just completely fell apart and like the demon just shows up and throws everybody against the wall and that's it <laughs> right i think maybe that's partly because they just had like volunteers and people who had just like watched a youtube video <laughs> yeah. on how to do this like i don't i don't think that they were dealing with experts which no maybe was a mistake they didn't believe is the thing I, you know i definitely that was one of my notes it's like they made this big deal out of how it doesn't really matter which religion it's that demons aren't particularly relig or allergic to one religion mm -hmm. or another it's just the belief the faith what have you but then they had 10 people there to make a circle around her yeah because you have to. And that circle fell apart so fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think any of those people had any real faith because if that's what is supposed to protect you from a demon, because none of them were protected. Yeah. I, I think this was one of those, you know, hand wavy movies where they're like, yeah, it's kind of a thing because the demon just sort of would possess different people and make them do things, usually making their face look like a coelacanth, you know, the demon fish. Mm hmm. And make them contort and then attack, trying to get this girl possessed. But he could just possess anybody he wants, anytime he wants. I mean, like, what's the problem? Well, I mean, I, I don't think he could at the beginning. Yeah, he got stronger. at some point it was like, oh, he's strong enough to even possess the dead now. And I'm like, wait, wasn't that always what he was doing? Like, <laughs> yeah. he, he came into the world in the dead brother. Like, True. why is this? Why are we surprised by this? <laughs> But in fact, he was then able to possess like just the living, like even her boyfriend at one point was yeah. taken over. And yeah, why why did it not just decide, okay, I'm going to possess well, her? Yeah, like she was, I guess she was 
maybe she was full of faith and hard to get rid of, but it didn't seem like she no, was. No, no, it did not seem like she was. Although at the end, that didn't feel like a happy ending to me. Like, no, I, I feel like the Dybbuk is definitely possessing one of, or both of the twins she's carrying. Sure. You know, it's the, it's how horror movies end. Yeah. A couple of my like regular all the time complaints. Okay. First of all, that boyfriend, he was one of those, as long as he's not being actively abusive, he's one of the <laughs> good ones. Sure. He was not great, yeah. but he was supposed to be great. Yeah. He, well, I mean, I don't know if he was supposed to be great. He was kind of irrelevant. Like, but like I, I agree. He was not, you know, if he's not attacking her, he must be a good guy. But Okay, but that's the thing. Like, at some point... Didn't one of her friends say something about like, oh, you know, I wish I could find a good oh, one like know. him or something like Probably. that. He was supposed to be this amazing guy. Mm -hmm. And all I could think was, you know, that guy doesn't pick his socks up. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I mean, and you know that he doesn't have any idea what's going on in the house and he's only going to do chores if she asks him to. And like, he's not a bad guy, but the bar is so low. <laughs> It's not all men, Sully. <laughs> he's exactly the kind of guy who would say that. Yeah. Also, yes. he's the kind of guy who would say, I don't think you're crazy. Maybe a little hormonal, but not crazy. Yeah. And think that he's being the good guy in saying that. Yeah, he wasn't the most supportive. It's true. It was ridiculous. Speaking of bad relationships with men, uh, what about her dad? Okay, why did she and Romy, her friend, neither one of them had any parents around? Well, she, that that was the thing. It's like, it'd be one thing if they're just, you know, never interacted. But she goes and finds her dad at his fancy important meeting, talks to him. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, you ate your twin or whatever. <laughs> you strangled your twin <laughs> in the womb. And then he's gone. That's That's it. Like, they, they needed 10 people to do this exorcism. And she wasn't like, hey, Dad. No. No. no none of that. He's not, not involved. All. Not at all. But also, where were Romy's parents this whole time? Why was she well, home alone know. all the time? I mean, yeah. I thought of this movie as like a college movie because they were in college, but they were at houses. They were at like, you know, old people houses, not... Right. They lived not with their parents. Frat houses. Like good millennials do. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. She just... Her parents were invisible. They yeah. were Dibbuks. <laughs> okay, Romy is part of my other complaint. I can complain about Romy. Oh, go for it. I will fill in afterwards if well, there's something I want to add. All I want to say is she's terrible and I hate her. <laughs> she is terrible. And I also hated her. And I hated that she was the black sidekick. Yeah. Who apparently had no social like skills whatsoever like she was the one who I you know, know could walk down the hall in the nursing home and just say terrible yeah, things like, out loud Ew, as people, old walk people by. are gross or you know just they walk through the lobby and she steals a handful of candy just <laughs> yeah, she, for no reason just everything she did was just socially unacceptable <laughs> right which would be fine except that there were no other black people aside from idris elba true who also, like, was fine, but then ended up getting possessed and, you know, yeah, being all, like, one. animal attacky. Like, yeah. they were both the kind of black character who are token characters who end up mildly reinforcing the idea that black people don't have good social skills. Mm -hmm. Like, well, that they don't fit into society. And Romy's, we've, we've been complaining about her social skills, but she also hit a child with her car and then swore at him and drove away. I mean, to be fair, <laughs> he was clearly not injured at all and was definitely possessed. I know. But yes, completely inappropriate. Like, it was the idea that, yeah, well... Clearly, because this is a black girl, she would hit somebody with her car and then drive away and, like, not yeah, have a problem with it. It's just very weird. Yeah. Again, like with the, whatever his name is, the boyfriend, it wasn't overt, but it was just that, like, subtle reinforcement of nonsense that happens in the world. Yeah. I and think, it annoyed me. Yeah, it's like, it's nothing they intended, but it's just kind of where they went. Right. Because that's where it always goes. Mm -hmm. And it was... You know, I, and I'm not saying like, yeah, there can be 
black characters who aren't perfect. But if you're only going to have two black characters in your whole entire movie, you have to think about that. Yeah. I mean, and then you go, you know, to go even a little bit further, like there, the Jewish mysticism was in this movie. Yes, purely it was. For the mysticism of it. Like it was, yeah. you know, it was like, ooh, hol- the Holocaust is dramatic. Like it all felt very appropriation-y. Yeah. And not not that I don't think they did their research because it, it felt like they had done their research. But it also didn't feel like there was really any reason for that to be where the story went or where it came from or anything. Well, it is cool to have, you know, you're going to have an exorcism movie and you're like, okay, this time it's not Catholic, it's Jewish. That's so true. So we've got a different tradition, which I wanted to mention the movie The Possession is the other Jewish exorcism movie that we watched a long time ago, and I'm pretty sure we haven't reviewed it, but um, it was pretty fun too. It's a mm. yeah. Jewish exorcism. I mean, yeah, I don't think it was anything intentional. I don't think any of this was malicious. I just think it was, it's that lack of awareness, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Although I, it really did, there was a lot of research done into like, how the exorcism was done and how the the book worked and that sort of stuff, I guess, or at least it felt that way from or they made from it our all perspective. Up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I did not do research to find out if. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Maybe there were. Uh, maybe it was written by and directed by Jewish people, and it was you know, it's not appropriation at all. It's representation. But I maybe I didn't it's feel great. Like that. Could be great. Yeah. Speaking of representation, this is the first movie I can think of that I have ever seen that represented the child of the earth. So many times. So many times. That's a creepy bug. Yes. I should say I'm pretty sure there's a more normal name for them that other people know. So if you don't know, you can Google child of the earth. It is a gigantic creature. It looks kind of like an ant, except it's like three inches long and fat and gross and kind of damp looking all the time yes and they do indeed live in the earth i first encountered one digging a hole sometime and when i was a kid and i was like holy crap what is happening to me i thought i was being possessed by a dibbuk at the time it was so scary um in spanish they're called el nino de la tierra (laughs) that makes sense sometimes called the jerusalem cricket right that's the name yeah oh Oh, oh! Sometimes yeah. called the Jerusalem Cricket. I get it. Um, and sometimes called the Potato Bug. Oh no! A Potato Bug is a roly poly. <laughs> or it's a. This says uh, many American Indian tribes call it the Old Bald Man. <laughs> I mean, that also that's works the translation for this movie. Of what they call it. <laughs> yeah. So. So okay, Jerusalem Cricket. They yep, were going for that, yep. but I was thinking. Back when I thought there was going to be pregnancy involved in this movie, that, oh, it's child of the earth. They're sneaking that in there, and it's like, oh, it's a child thing. I don't know. They just sort of randomly picked a gross bug. Might have been a little bit of both. I mean, I'm honestly surprised the child of the earth doesn't feature in more horror movies. Yeah. It's it's very horrific. Yeah, like it's, you don't think it's something that's just around normal places, but it really is. It's just anywhere. Yeah, it's unpleasant, and it's bigger than it should be. Oh, it's so big. <laughs> Big enough to be startling. I know. Like, like it's not just that it's big. It's meaty. It's <laughs> huge. Like, like, bugs can be a few inches long, but they're all skinny. Right. But this like is a chunk. you could skewer it and make a meal. I bet you could, and it would be a gross meal. <laughs> I, I suspect it's a meal somewhere. Yeah, probably. They're probably really tasty. Mm. I feel like we need to learn to embrace the bug Lifestyle. food. Because it's going to become a thing. Someday. Supply chain issues, Sully. Right? Right? Okay, one more complaint that I have. Okay. So I've complained about the mild misogyny and the mild racism. There was a whole thing about the eyes, right? They, oh, so much stuff about eyes. So the Nazis at the beginning were trying to, or, you know, way back, were trying to, like, do experiments to change brown eyes to blue. I get it. It's very Nazi. And then Casey as all of this is happening to her, is, like, developing heterochromia. Mm-hmm. 
which I didn't know was something that could come on in like. Does it turn out it that's normal that it can happen? I mean, I have not done any research. <laughs> But the eye doctor in the movie was explaining how, like, sometimes it can be caused by... Melanoma. Right, like a cancer or... Um, there was another thing that he said. There was something about a trauma to the eye. And I was oh, like, oh, because wow. she got, you know, that kid stabbed her with the mirror piece at yeah. one point early on. So she's developing this this heterochromia. And so, like, there's, the eyes definitely play a big part in the movie, like, symbolically. So when she was throwing up in the toilet in the bar there was graffiti on the yeah. bathroom wall that said um in the kingdom of the blind the one-eyed man is king which i've heard before yeah and never before have i really thought about how ableist <laughs> that phrase is like i understand what it's trying to say sure. right yeah but also if everyone in your kingdom is blind <laughs> <laughs> sort of feel like the one-eyed man is going to be the one that's at a disadvantage in some way. Well, he's going to be singled out for sure. Right? Like, I don't know. it's super ableist. There's nothing to say that a kingdom full of blind people couldn't be just fine <laughs> without their one-eyed dude. So, yeah. and like, I've heard that so much before, and I've always just thought about this, the the metaphor of it. But seeing it, for some reason, written on that bathroom <laughs> wall today, I was like, huh, that's that's pretty gross. <laughs> yeah. And with that bathroom wall and ch children of the earth pouring out of the toilets, Ugh. that was the other thing that showed up in this movie a bunch was like, it was child of the earth related. It was like these bug tentacle claws that would tear out of the walls and stuff and sometimes out of people's mouths. Didn't really have any meaning, had nothing to do with the monster. It was just, this'll be creepy. That is exactly how I felt about that whole bathroom scene. I was yeah. like, this is just them messing around and being like, how weird can we get? I feel like a lot of the movie was that. But I liked that they kept it consistent. Like, there was this whole thing through the movie about dogs with upside down faces. And well, because there was the goat with the upside <laughs> yeah, down face in, the, in book. the book of mirrors. I feel like... Somebody saw an old drawing like that when they were making the movie, and they're uh -huh. like, ooh, let's play on that. Well, and even Eli, the old guy in the nursing home, mm -hmm. he, he like did that. did that crawl on your back thing, and then his head twisted around. and Yeah. Mm -mm. I don't like the body horror that comes with exorcism movies. It's upsetting. Yeah. I'm a little bit worried that my ratings here at the end of the month are going to be even lower than the already lower than normal ratings for the year. Like, I don't know if my lack of interest in the movies we've watched lately have been because the movies have not been interesting or because I have some kind of like attention fatigue going on. It's a lot of movies. Well, and I don't even know that it's that. Like, just not not that we watch so many movies, because maybe that's it. But I mean, whatever. I think it's more of a whole life thing. Like, it's not just in the movie watching and rating that I'm finding myself super distracted all the time. Like, for the last two weeks, I have had the hardest time getting myself, oh, probably even more than two weeks. It's been a while. I described it to somebody as my brain feels like butterflies and everything I do is me like trying to set out trays of, you know, sweet mm -hmm. water to get the butterflies to settle. And, and, and then I start to try to do a project and the butterflies all fly away in a panic because they are afraid of whatever I'm trying to do. I cannot get the butterflies to sit still. Yeah. So like watching this movie, I wasn't disliking it, but also I was very not focused on it. I was coloring and I checked my phone a few times and I completely checked out from the whole situation like for a while where I was just like suddenly realized I had no idea what was going on in the movie. So I guess I want to give this movie three pillow scissors out of five because it wasn't terrible. I didn't dislike it, but I also did not feel engaged or enthralled by it in any way. Yeah. It didn't feel like it had anything super new or interesting to share, but it wasn't 
It wasn't horrible. I don't know. I feel a little bad for giving it such a low rating, but I also, like, can't justify anything higher than that. I think that's okay. I'm concerned that you're experiencing late-onset ADHD, but that's okay. <laughs> it's probably caused by watching ADHD TikTok all the time. Probably. I will say, I think your assessment of this movie is very fair in that it's a very kind of standard movie. It, it goes back to Curse of La Llorona, I think it was, where this is a Hollywood schlockbuster. Like, it's, mm, okay. there's nothing wrong with it. It's a fun romp mm -hmm. through this adventurous bit of scary stuff. But it has nothing important to say. It's just for fun, and it's very lightweight, and it feels like something James Wan made, meaning the Conjuring series and Annabelle and all of those. Yeah. All those movies are just so fluff. They're fun, but they're fluff. Yeah. And that's kind of how this felt. I enjoyed it a lot. From the first minute, this movie was just nonstop creepiness, which I really liked. They didn't... They didn't waste any time setting it up, which is you know, like one of the rules of storytelling is you show the normal world, then you make a change in it. And how do they adapt to the change? But no, there was no normal world. We just were straight into this is weird and creepy and we're just doing that for the mm -hmm. whole movie. And that actually slowed down later in the movie. I thought it was better earlier on. So I thought it was fun and exciting and it, it was hand wavy, which is not my favorite. I, I would prefer a more solid consistent world but they still you know they they picked upside down dogs and they went with that so that's good <laughs> which was just very weird but yeah. they did it so i enjoyed it and i don't think it's great but i do think it's a little better than you did so i'm actually gonna go and give this one four pillow scissors out of five i really had a good time with it it was one of my more enjoyable ones this month okay I think what I'm realizing is that my rating scale largely falls on, okay, so there's there's a dividing line, and on one side, it's movies that actively tackle mm -hmm. issues. Right. And on the other side, it's movies that actively make issues worse. <laughs> yes. And then this movie is just in the middle. So, like, I, that's it's just a three. And apparently that's all I care that's about. That's your scale. That's my scale. Is this movie trying to make the whole world a better place? Or is it making the whole world a worse place? But this is coming from the person who gave House of a Thousand Corpses a five. Yeah, I can't explain that. See, you used to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you could explain it. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> Sorry. No, I mean, I think there are definitely other other things that come into play sometimes. Like, there are movies that can stand out from the crowd. I will say for me, general. when I see that a movie's, like, tackling something and bringing up issues or going there or whatever, mm -hmm. that's a big plus. Oh, that for sure. makes a big difference. But it's also fun when a movie is fun. So, I like that, too. Yeah. And when a movie is, like, actively built around racism or misogyny like that's a big minus yeah but then there's the ones where it's like okay i can't really i mean this isn't great but i also can't blame you for being a product of the system you <laughs> have been living in your whole life like i hope you become a little more aware of the world around you i don't know i don't yeah. know it's just very middle of the road so let's talk about the Unborn from 1991. Which was the Evil Twins of this movie. Yes. 1991. Officially period piece movies now. It looked like it, yes. Yeah. Yeah, there was a sweater in this movie that Paul Reiser definitely wore during Mad About You. There were several things. She wore a, a like a silky bathrobe for a significant <laughs> portion of the movie that clearly had massive shoulder pads in it. Right. I'm like, why? Why? Because you want to look like a linebacker when you're sleeping. You know, it was, she had to, she had to be a, an empowered woman, <laughs> yeah. even at home in her bathrobe. Yeah. This Unborn was 
very much about birth and pregnancy and unbirth also. It featured the the only time I've seen a literal back alley abortion in a movie. Yes. This movie went there. <laughs> it sure did. In several situations. I'm not sure there would there would be discussions to be had about what it was saying as it went <laughs> to these various places. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um and then of course there's the question of, you know, what it's saying through the perspective of 2021 versus the perspective perspective of 1991. I mean, that's it's a lot of time. It's a shockingly large a amount lot of, of time. time. <laughs> it's more time than I wish it was. So this movie gave me serious The Devil's Advocate vibes, which is a movie that I watched probably before I should have watched it. Like, <laughs> I remember... Like, it kind of burned itself into my head in a way that makes me think I was maybe a little young for what, I, you know, yeah. the ideas behind this movie. The Unborn from 1991 has kind of that similar vibe of, you know, the couple that wants to be pregnant and. Yeah, and it's willing you know, to go to yeah. dangerous occult lengths to do it. Yeah, and like what you're willing to give up in terms of your own morality and ethics in order to become a parent, which is not <laughs> something I understand. Yeah. And okay, I'm definitely speaking out of turn saying this, but it's just something I always think I'm going to get in trouble for saying it. <laughs> okay. They they always go to these insane lengths and they end up crying and blood everywhere and it's terrible. They could just adopt. People out there need parents. Adopt them. And they're willing to go all this way, but they're not willing to go, eh, let's go adopt somebody. There is a deep drive that some people feel yeah. to procreate, which, I mean, I get it. Like, it's, it's, just, it's built into it's our It's important genes. that we have that. I honestly think the fact that you and I don't have that deep drive is, I mean, that's the abnormal yeah. human like position, I think. Maybe not as abnormal as we are conditioned to think. But, but yeah, these, these movies definitely like crank that drive up. Yeah. And, and that is not a thing. And I'm not talking about parents being willing to go to extreme lengths to protect their children or even their unborn yeah. children. Like that's something different. It's the going to extreme lengths. It's the selling your soul in order to be able to build your own human. Yeah. Which I'm not saying is wrong uh, uh, <laughs> to each their own, right? But I definitely do not understand it. Me neither. So that made this movie a little bit harder for me to connect with, I think. Because I was like, I, yeah. I don't, I can't, I can't get to the whole place well, it starts sure. from. Sure. And I hope this doesn't count as a spoiler, but the creepy robot baby made <laughs> me have trouble connecting with this movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> yes. Oh. Yeah, there's a lot going on in this movie. It's so, pretty wild. Because we can't spoil it, I think maybe we should jump right into rating it. Sure. I'm going to give the 1991 The Unborn two glowy baby orbs out of five. I don't think it's an actively terrible movie, but it loses points in comparison to the movie from 2009, because it just, the production values were not yeah, great. They were not. I mean, I think 1991, like there, there is some reason for that, but also it just wasn't great. Yeah. There was just a lot of weirdness in this movie that is kind of hard to explain. Like, it's a science-y movie, but the science makes no sense nope. at all. Nope. And, yeah, it's interesting. It, it is an interesting plot. And during watching it, I had this feeling of, I really want someone to remake this movie, you know, using modern thinking and, you know, making it appropriate. Here's the thing. If somebody is vaguely curious about what we've what we're talking about and is like, that sounds like something I might be interested in, go watch The Devil's Advocate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's pretty different. I mean, it is, but it isn't really. Like, they just made it more interesting. <laughs> like, it's not, it's missing, it's, 
just so surface. The unborn is just so surface. Like, there's nothing that interesting about it. Yeah, it's, well, what I was referring to as interesting is sort of a, I can't spoil it, but like the conspiracy layer involved in it, the, what the whole system going on yeah. is, which is totally different from Devil's Advocate. Yes, that's true. That's true. So, I was just comparing it like that there yeah. was a conspiracy level and yeah. whatever. So I'm right with you. I want to give this two glowing baby orbs out of five. It was pretty dumb, but it was all right. It was not not garbage. It was pretty good. Not not pretty good. <laughs> it was okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you want to spend a couple hours watching a classic old ridiculous horror movie this this would do the job yeah it really had the it had a very 80s feel to it with all yeah. the crazy gore effects and stuff it almost has like a gremlins vibe to <laughs> yes. it yes right yeah. Yeah. especially the robot baby yeah yeah so i mean yeah there's definitely a place for this kind of movie but that doesn't make it a good movie <laughs> no but it was pretty fun <laughs> all right well um so we're moving on from the unborn and what are we moving toward? Well, this is where evil twin magic gets a bit tricky. Okay. Because our movie for tomorrow is 1BR from 2019, which a lot of people have told me to see. So I'm very excited to see 1BR. Okay. It is hard to find a twin to a movie called 1BR. What I came up with is 2003's Japan's one missed call. You can see how it sounds almost the same. I hear it. I hear it. Okay, so I'm thinking something about an apartment. Yes, yeah, definitely and then an apartment. A Ringu kind of a movie where you miss a call and and then you're dead. Bad things happen. But yeah. like you know, one of those like pass the curse kind of movies that Japan oh, likes sure. to do so well. That's yeah. what I'm expecting. And from it's these from two. 2003. It's the era. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Also, I've seen it before. <laughs> All right. Well, that's cheating, but okay. Yeah. All right. Well, then we'll be back here tomorrow to talk about those. All right. See you then. Nothing but TikTok songs in my brain. Yeah. And do Bo Burnham songs count as TikTok songs? Because that's what's always in my brain. I mean, they kind of do. That's what I sort of thought. Uh, I could be talking about a movie which is an even-numbered movie. So it's my turn to do it. And you got to...